Hello and welcome back to Gary Keep It Simple. Today a nice one, how a cassette deck or any other recorder works. But don't worry, I'm not going to get bogged down in too much technical. This is Keep It Simple. This video is for people who are new to cassettes or just returning to cassettes and they want to know how to make a good recording. They're not quite sure how it works, they just want a bit of understanding. I've tried my best on this to try and make it as simple as possible so that you and I can understand it and that there's nothing too complicated. However, I'm not a graphic designer and therefore some of the some of the pictures might be a bit simplistic, some of the similes, well, you know, I did my best. So without further delay, let's get stuck in. Try and keep up, but you know, you can always rewind if you find something that's a bit too fast. I'll try my best not to go too slow and not to go too fast. This is what the bit where you put the tape in looks like. This is the layer of a standard two head deck. It has a combined record and playback head and an erase head. I've labelled the things up here to make it clearer for you. In cassette decks, the supply reel and the take up reel, all they do is supply the tape and take it up. They don't do any of the movement of the tape except in fast forward and rewind. When it's actually playing, the take up spool literally just takes the tape away from the mechanisms. If it's pulling too hard, then there could be a fault, but that's not the same thing. In a properly set up cassette deck, the supply reel supplies the tape and the take up reel takes it away. But the capstan and the pinch roller do all the speed control, all the control of uh, wow and flutter and all that sort of stuff. It's all down to the capstan and the pinch roller. So the next thing to look at is the erase head on the left hand side. That looks like just a black lump, and it is. But what, what it actually is, is a very precise electromagnet. It, it literally wipes across the tape and takes away the signal. That's how it does the erase. In the middle, we have the record and playback head. This takes the signal from what you're feeding in and puts it onto the tape. And when you're in replay, obviously it pulls it off so that you can hear it, but it doesn't take it off the tape. And finally, we're back to the capstan and the pitch roller again. There is a video that I made about this, but essentially, the pinch roller pushes the tape against the capstan and the capstan is controlled by proper servo controlled motors. What that means is it's very stable in speed and the pinch roller pushes the tape against it and that's how the tape is pulled through. Nice and constant. When we're talking about capstans and pinch rollers it's very very important to keep them clean. Clean and grease free. I don't want to labour this too hard but you're dragging a piece of plastic with metal stuck to it and it, you never know where it's been so when it gets dragged through there will be deposits of debris that come off and it's very very important that you keep this two bits clean if you keep these clean you shouldn't have any problem with two tapes just to clarify so the tape comes off the supply reel goes down across the erase head where it would get erased before it's recorded on or where it would do nothing if it's being played back then it goes across the record head then it goes through the capstan and the pinch roller where it's being squeezed like a mangle with the washing. Then it goes back up onto the take up reel. Now that's the way it's done. It's nice and simple. All speed control is done by the capstan and there should be no great tensions on this sort of deck. Now we're going to look at the way the heads actually sit in a cassette. You can see here the tape comes down from the supply reel, goes round a roller over the erase head which is there because it's turned on and off electrically. It doesn't matter which position it's in, but if it's forward, it can be worked. Then you go over the record and playback head, and then it goes through between the capstan and the pinch roller, around the roller at the end, and up onto the take-up reel. It's nice and simple. This is the way a two-head single capstan machine would look, and this is what most people have got. Here we're looking at a similar thing here, but it's got two capstans and two pinch rollers, and one head in the middle. This is the sort of thing you'd find on an auto-reverse deck or a deck with a closed loop dual capstan. Maybe a three head with that function, could be a two head, depends on how good a deck you've got. But anyway, this is the same as the previous one, but with two pinch rollers and capstans. The big thing to look at here is that's the erase head and that's where the second pinch roller is. And because of the location, they're, they're slightly different in the cassette. And the erase head is teeny tiny, but it does exactly the same job in exactly the same way. That brings us nicely to this, which is a three head deck. If you look, you can see there are the teeny tiny erase head. And then on the right hand side, you've got that, which is the playback head, and that, which is the record head. 
and there you go there's the arrow for the teeny tiny erase head with this you've got this this is a posh one you've got the closed loop dual capstan type mechanism that i mentioned before this sort of deck is prized by collectors and if you've got one you're doing very well for yourself bias what is meant by bias well actually it's more properly known as recording bias and it doesn't mean what sort of music you like we'll get on to it now tape bias from wikipedia the free encyclopedia tape bias is a term for two techniques ac bias and dc bias that improve the fidelity of analog tape recorders dc bias is the addition of direct current to the audio signal that is being recorded ac bias is the addition of an inaudible high frequency signal generally around 40 to 150 kilohertz to the audio signal most contemporary tape recorders use ac bias when recording magnetic tape has a non-linear response as determined by its corrosivity without bias this response results in poor performance especially at low signals a recording signal that generates a magnetic field strength less than the tape's corrosivity cannot magnetize the tape and produce little playback signal bias increases the signal quality of most recordings significantly by pushing the signal into the more linear zones of the tape's magnetic transfer function Put that into simple words. If you haven't got enough oomph, you're not going to get the thing to go onto the tape. And so they add the oomph in the way of bias. DC bias is like hitting it with a sledgehammer, whereas AC bias is like tickling it in a way that you want it to be tickled. If you look at this, you can see that the signal's there and it's not managing to get it off the bottom line. We want to get it to where this, the other two lines are. So this is what it would look like with only the top of the signal being recorded. So what we do is we raise it to be in that part of the tape spectrum. The coercivity is right. We don't want it to be too high. We don't want it to be too low. We want it to be nicely in the middle where it's linear. As we said, we could just jack it up with DC. But the trouble with DC is it's just one lump or something. It's hard to visualize it. So let me show you something that is not the same, but has the same sort of effects. You've all seen one of these people. And what he does is he goes around and he pushes the sand in the right way. But he's got a machine that's vibrating. And then you look at this and you think, oh, what's this then? This is how they deal with powders. Trying to get them into small spaces. Trying to get them to mould. Trying to get them to do what they want them to do. You can think of the tape as being in the same situation. By hitting it with a vibrating signal, which is the AC bias, you can get the tape to do what you want it to do. Nice, neat and small. In effect, it becomes malleable and takes the mould that you're giving it. So the fidelity is superb. That started at just under 4 litres and it's ended up with just over 2.5 litres, purely by a bit of vibration of gravity, which is the same sort of effect that you'd expect with bias on the tape is the addition of the two forces which give you the results which in this case is a nice smooth pot of powder and in our case would be a really good sounding tape you will have heard of high bias and standard bias and metal bias they're all different levels which are specific to the type of tape being used if you've got a type 2 tape you do not bias it the same as a type 1 tape most tapes are manufactured to a standard and so are around right about the same for each type but you can on posh machines get controls which are actually there to allow you to fine-tune it so and on other machines you could get really posh you can start setting the levels to be so that they exactly match what you record is what you get off to be able to custom tune the tape to the machine these things are very nice they're not necessary and it depends on what sort of machine you've got However, if you've got the right tape for the right machine, it doesn't matter whether there's knobs on it or not, because if it's set to that tape, it will be giving you the best it can do. Most of the tapes are mostly right most of the time. What you have to do is go and try the odd different one to, if you're not happy with what you get on one tape. If, for instance, you're trying to use a Bassif Chrome on a Japanese deck, you may find it's not so good. In which case, get yourself a TDK Chrome you'll probably find that works better 
When I say better, I don't mean that the tape itself is better. I just mean that the sound will be better because the tape has to be set for the machine and the machine has to be set for the tape. The little diagram in the middle there shows you the correlation between bias level and response of the tape. If you apply more bias, then you'll get better low frequency response, but you'll lose the treble. If you take the, tr the bias down, you'll lose, you'll gain some treble, but you'll lose some bass. It's a case of getting it in the right place so that you get the best of both worlds. One of the things you hear people say, which is really confusing, because it's actually wrong, is you've got to give it some negative bias, or you've got to give it whatever. You can't give it negative bias. Bias is a level. You've got less level and more level. And it's marked on those knobs as being minus 20 and plus 20. But you're not giving it negative bias. What you're doing is taking the bias away by the amount of decibels, which is a, just a number, that it says on there. Don't get confused. Don't worry about it. Just set it to what it should be, and you're fine. I want to show you this. This is real world. This is a tape, a brand new tape. I'm going to get it out, and I'm going to put it into my deck and I'm going to fiddle with the bias control and ex explain to you what's happening so you can see really what's what. Brand new tape, new old stock I would guess. Flip right. tape. So, brand new tape. Quality. Okie dokie, put it into there. Now set the frequency up. I'm going to use 150 hertz on one channel and I'm going to use 7 kilohertz on the other channel. One is bass, hum, and the other is treble. Eee. There's enough right as you can see they're both set to be exactly the same level which is 0 db now what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn the knob a bit and a bit and a bit and a bit after i put it into record mode there we go so that's on total negative bias and then i'm going to turn it up and then turn it up and then turn it up and turn it up and when you play it back you will see the results it's quite interesting this is a handy way of setting up your machine if you're one of the ones that's got a machine without I codes, as I have. And I've got a proper video on this, you could follow it all the way through. Replay. Anyway, that's how it works on there. So let's just have a quick look at the playback. Should be playback any second now. Two, one, go. Right, so there we have it on full negative bias. And we've got the bottom signal is a bit bigger than there now it's level. stepped, and it's about equal. And now, let's see what happens. There'll be another step. No, oh, and the top high. channel is getting a bit higher. So uh, there we go. So a little bit more, and it's even more. And now, what's actually it. happening is the bottom channel is getting less. So not only is the top one getting stronger, the bottom one's getting weaker. And that's the effect of bias on a tape in the real world. So what you have to do is set it to where it was the best, which was equal, which was nine on the counter. I could now just play you lots of bits of music and twiddle the knob and say, look at the difference on there and that. But you wouldn't actually get any benefit because A, I don't know what you're listening to it on and B, you don't know what it's meant to sound like anyway. So at the end of the day, you wouldn't actually hear anything necessarily any better. So finally, here we come to the last bit, levels. If you drive the tape too hard, you will overdrive it and you will start to clip. You can see on this diagram, that the black line has gone into the red and also that the black line has gone into the noise of very non-linear section. What that means is that you're going to get out a sound that is not right. I can show you some pictures in a second but you will have to understand that when you're going to overdrive what you're going to do is you're going to not be able to push as hard as, as it wants to so it's going to take the top off the, off the curve and similarly on the bottom and that means you're going to end up with sounds that are just not right. I can show you what they look like, but again, I can't really show you uh, what they sound like because we're on YouTube. So Kit, these are the pictures. Now, the top right-hand picture is a sort of thing you get with a sag where the, the if you've got a power supply problem or whatever, it would actually cause that. It would give you, that's a low battery in a cassette player. The top left-hand picture is what the, pi the actual audio going onto the tape would look like. That's a bias signal with a low frequency tone on it. And the bottom picture there, you see, it, I've actually made this one, but what I've done is I've said, well, let's clip the top of the signal a bit and drag it down. Now you see how it doesn't line up. Well, that's the problem. That would not sound nice. 
and that's why it's very important that you get your levels right and the correct levels will give you the best results I've also got on here some pictures which were taken just recently this is a one kilohertz tone produced by a digital source and what you're going to see next is the output from a recorder that did the tone this tone was recorded at perfect levels but you can see on the output there are some spikes there's one there at uh, 3 kilohertz and one there at um, 5 kilohertz and then there's some other little ripples that's called harmonic distortion and that is because the peak is being pushed just to the point where it's just starting to clip and that's producing those sounds and that would give you a raspy sound, a, a, a shrill sound within the sound that you're listening to again I can't actually play it for you because we're what I can do is show you this, this is the same frequency at a lower level and there is no distortion, there are no peaks on it so that's how important it is, get it right and it will sound beautiful there are some other things you might hear about, if it depends who you run with but there's a thing called mole and there's a thing called sol simply they're this referring to how good or bad the tape is at taking signals it really doesn't matter because what you do is you set it up as we've described and then you play it back and if it doesn't sound right you've got a problem but if you set it up to within the parameters normally set up which is uh, around about the 0 dB or less preferably slightly less you will end up with good results and that's the way you want it to be the other stuff is all getting a bit geeky and I don't think you want it because we want to keep this simple anyway there's a lot more I could go into but we won't because we want to keep it simple I hope you've got a basic understanding of how a cassette or any other tape recorder works and how important or not important some of the features are if you got something out of this video, then thanks. I'm glad you enjoyed it. If you'd like to subscribe or leave a comment or both or share, please do. It all helps. And uh, I'll catch you again sometime. Let me know if there's any videos you'd like to see. Put them in the comments. Thank you. Bye-bye.